Then, depending on the business, there might be some other benefits. So, for example, if you're a B2C business, uh, I think the future, everyone understands, lies in personalization. Hello, world. This is Better Tech, a podcast where we chat with some of the most successful leaders about the latest industry developments. So, join us as we explore the world reliant on tech. This episode is brought to you by Texel, a leading software development company. Check them out at techcell.com. We're joined today by Dr. Stylinos Kempakis, CEO of the Tesseract Academy and Data Science Advisor at London Business School, and Seep Khan, Director of Innovation and Technology at Texel. You're listening to Peritech, and without further ado, let's listen to our guests. Hey, Stylinos, how are you? I'm great, thank you. How are you? I'm doing very well, thanks. So before we ju- uh, take a deep dive into the technical discussion that we are going to have, um, why don't you go ahead and give the audience a brief introduction about yourself? Yeah, sure, absolutely. So I'm a data scientist. Um, I live in London, United Kingdom. Uh, I've been in the area of data science and AI for a long time. I'd say it must be about a decade now. Uh, I have a PhD in machine learning, and uh, I'm involved in various ventures, uh, but for the most part, my work uh, is around explaining data science and AI to decision makers and helping companies utilize these technologies. Uh, people can learn more about me on my website, the datascientist.com, and I've also recently published a book on that topic called The Decision Maker's Handbook to Data Science, which is available on Amazon by A Press. Mm-hmm. That sounds wonderful. Thanks for the quick introduction. So uh, we can now go ahead and uh, discuss the topic that we have, which is the five reasons AI is crucial to business growth in 2020. So uh, before we before we jump into the topic and discuss that in greater detail, can you like tell to the audience what AI is and what it is not? Like for example, there are a lot of misconceptions of what AI is and everyone in this world is sort of has their own definition. So in your opinion, what do you think AI is and what it is not? I think this is a great question and it's a question I'm asked very often. Uh, For example, many people uh, confuse AI with uh, machine learning uh, or they confuse deep learning with AI. Uh, Mm -hmm. So I'd say that artificial intelligence um, might not be so much of a scientific field as more of an end goal. Yeah, so it's a vision which uh, was originated in in the 50s. Um, The vision was to create a thinking machine. And since the 50s, we've seen many approaches to uh, realizing this vision. And the latest approach, the latest iteration in AI is machine learning, uh, where machine learning is about creating algorithms which can learn from data. So for the most part, Uh, What most uh, companies refer to as AI, uh, it's really machine learning algorithms, which are very good at very specific jobs. And uh, the reason that uh, people are using the word AI uh, is largely for marketing purposes. It just uh, sounds cooler. Uh, But if you talk with experts, everyone knows that we don't really have anything that uh, really resembles uh, true AI currently. Uh, That being said, uh, these terms have been used and abused so much uh, that uh, many people are are comfortable saying, oh, you know, we're using AI or we're talking about AI, even when in reality everyone knows, you know, it's not AI, it's more like a machine learning algorithm doing something very specific. (laughs) Okay, okay, that explains it. So, uh, I mean, in this uh, age of AI and machine learning, data is sort of the most important thing because that is something on which AI operates and machine learning also sort of uh, helps and learn and then uh, algorithms take intelligent decisions on the behalf of uh, business decision makers as we have said. So, uh, I mean, from a data scientist perspective, uh, how important it is to have uh, the data in place on which these decisions can be uh, uh, made? Well, that, that's super important because uh, you'd rather have uh, the right data and a good amount of data and use a very simple algorithm to analyze this data uh, rather than have a team in place of world-class data scientists 
uh, without any data. Um, so for, for me, I'd rather, you know, if I had to choose, I'd rather have the first. I'd rather have, you know, an amazing data set um, and, uh, you know, a very simple method to analyze it than have a world-class team with no data. And one of the reasons that um, in my work, be it like workshops or my blog or my book, I talk a lot about data management, about data strategy. And many companies, they're trying to undergo, for example, a digital transformation, and uh, they're just not ready. You know, maybe the data is not in the right format. Maybe they're not collecting the right kinds of data. There are all kinds of issues. Um, it's just that many times companies are carried away by all the hype that's surrounding AI and machine learning. They're carried away by deep learning, by cool sounding algorithms. Um, but in reality, you you, it's, it's better if you just have, let's say, a dashboard <laughs> based, that's based on quality data rather than a really cool algorithm which is not based on anything. <laughs> okay, thanks for that uh, information. So, uh, so be, be it any field in computer science, be it like data structures, databases, data warehouse, or whatever we call it, there are two sides of things. One is the academic side, the other one is the practical practical side, which is sort of applied on the industrial side, right? So mm -hmm. how do you see AI being incorporated and implemented in sort of different industries um, ranging from education to healthcare and I mean, to software and like other related fields? Yeah, so that's an interesting question. Um, I believe that uh, from one industry to the next, the algorithms are more or less the same. I think the most prominent example of this is deep learning, uh, which can be used in many different, uh, you know, it's used basically in countless applications, yeah, from autonomous vehicles to, to healthcare. Uh, the differences from sector to sector are not on the algorithmic level, but they might be on the cultural level, on the kind of data that is being used. Um, so something that's very interesting for me is uh, seeing some sectors which might be 10 years ahead of other sectors, in terms of, you know, mm -hmm. the implementation of AI. And uh, essentially, I see AI going from one vertical to the next. Uh, the algorithms are still the same. It's just whether, you know, the upper management and other people within organizations, uh, they accept that, okay, this is valuable, this is how we should use it. Right. So now we can jump into the crux of the topic that we have today. So what, in your opinion, is the five ways or five reasons why AI is crucial to business growth in 2020. What do you think? So I think there are quite a few reasons. I mean, uh, the main, I'd say the main driver basically um, uh, is, there's the second key driver, which is automation. That everyone's been talking automation, about automation and rightly so, um, because AI is going to play a key role in automating many processes within various industries. And uh, I was reading some reports, like there was this report by PwC that AI and the automation is going to add billions in, you know, uh, in the world economy, etc. And essentially, it's a bit of an arms race because um, if your competitors are going to do it, you have to do it as well. So it's not only about growth, it's also about a uh, competitive advantage. Yeah, so that's like one major factor. Uh, then an an another like a key, um, you know, key, key part in, in growth and how AI is going to help companies achieve growth is that companies which are in industries where prediction plays a role, um, they're going to be disrupted. So if, for example, I don't know, you depend upon weather predictions, upon financial forecasts, if you care about forecasting demand or whatever, we become, now we have algorithms which become better and better in prediction. Uh, so that's also going to be very disruptive. Again, this doesn't apply to all industries, and everyone is very much focused on automation, but for me that is equally important. Uh, yeah. That industries where disruption plays a role, they're going to, sorry, that where forecasting plays a role, they're going to be disrupted. I mean, they're going to see improvements basically in, in, in the margins and efficiency. Uh, mm -hmm. So these, these are like the two key factors. And then say there are other like factors which uh, are going to facilitate this transition to an AI world. Yeah, so one such factor is the fact that we see many commoditized APIs, which are getting better and better. So whereas in the past, 
uh, you needed to have, let's say, you know, very skilled data scientists to build machine learning models. Uh, now there are like services by Google, IBM, uh, which can let you do all sorts of things from computer vision to analyzing data in a tabular format. Uh, so that's one. And um, also I think open source helps with this. Um, now we have like many good open source tools that so that even let's say software developers who are not really trained in machine learning or data science, they can still quite often build some basic applications. Uh, so in general, let's say that it just becomes easier to use data science, even in businesses where uh, data science might not be essential, but they're nice to have. So if, for example, you are an online retailer and uh, you, know, you don't consider really machine learning or data science a key component of your business, uh, but you're like, Oh, you know, it would be good if I could have some forecasts. Um, now it's very easy to do it. You might not even have to hire someone. So we suddenly see like data science being available to also smaller organizations, um, whereas, you know, a few years ago, maybe that wasn't the case. And again, in terms of how this assists growth, for me, it's about the automation in various processes. Um, and then it's about making more accurate predictions. Right, right, right. Got it. So in this uh, age, blockchain is also a sort of very emerging concept where sort of people are talking about um, like distributing the data um, using mm-hmm. blockchain and its related technology. So uh, what, do you, what do you think how AI and blockchain can be coupled together in order to create a more secure distributed uh, infrastructure for storing information um, on, on the cloud or otherwise? Yeah, so there are a few ways to go about this. Uh, and obviously, there's no standard solution yet because blockchain is still in its, in its relatively early days. Uh, mm-hmm. So one way to do this is by using something like IPFS, uh, the Interplanetary File System, uh, which essentially is something between a blockchain and GitHub, let's say, and Dropbox, a system which allows people to... Uh, share their data on a blockchain and at the same time uh, audit the trail of transactions around this data and give permission to the people and the organizations they want to give permission to. Uh, So that's like a great idea for data sharing. And then obviously we have a smart contract uh, where AI has a clear, um, you know, there's a clear application for AI in this case Mm -hmm. uh, because smart contract you know, you can use AI to see whether some conditions are satisfied. Right. And now, whether this is going to be more secure or not, uh, it really depends on the context. Uh, I think that one of the issues with many good blockchain ideas is that, um, and let's say around data collection, is that you might have an element that's outside of the blockchain which we have no control of. So let's take supply chains, for example. There are many companies investing in supply chains for blockchain and using blockchain. And um, when you have a supply chain, it makes sense to use blockchain to record everything that takes place and it makes it easier to audit. And maybe you have some smart contracts, you use a computer vision system to track uh, the, the transfer of goods, etc. But if within this chain, there is someone like a, you need a human to record a piece of information at some point in this chain, um, then this is a weak, you know, basically this is a, a weak spot because... Uh, maybe the human makes a mistake, you know, and it's very difficult to to fix this. Um, but if that's not the case, if there are no outside, no components outside of a blockchain, um, then it's very easy to see how, for example, you could automate this. You know, maybe um, I, I can imagine a world where you have, let's say, Internet of Things, a computer vision systems, a supply chain based on AI, which you know they make sure that they track all the goods that are being transferred. Right. Right. So, uh, as you mentioned in the intro, that you have written a book for, mm-hmm. I mean, teaching AI to non-technical people, right? Especially executives. So, if yes. if we, I mean, talk from a high level perspective, what are the three main things which you think uh, executives having um, no technical background should consider while incorporating AI into their business? Yeah, so I think uh, it comes down, first of all, to greater efficiency. Yeah, mm-hmm. so it's, uh, first of all, it's very important to understand that now data collection is easy and it's cheap. 
Yeah. So if you have a business and you're like, even at a small scale or medium scale and above, it's very easy. You're probably generating lots of data. It's very easy to capture this data. Yeah. And you have lots of processes. So any process which you have, you can probably improve it in some, we can measure it, you can improve it in some way, and maybe you can even automate it in some way. So this is where AI can basically can provide some low hanging fruit in order to, you know, in order to increase your margins, to improve your efficiency. Then depending on the business, there might be some other benefits. So for example, if you're a B2C business, uh, I think the future, everyone understands, lies in personalization. So whereas in the past, a business just had to assume that the customers, they are, you know, they're different personas, let's say two, three, four different types of customers, and these are the people we're selling to. Now everything is bespoke, like marketing is bespoke. The products can be bespoke. Uh, in, like Netflix, for example, is great in this. They're using data analytics in order to understand what kind of shows they should produce. They're like, okay, what kind of show would our customers like to see? So, similarly, they have yeah. sort of, similarly, they, they have like sort of uh, also implemented data science techniques to actually figure out what sort of content a particular geographic uh, location users are doing. And then they are sort of promoting that content into uh, that particular region. So, mm -hmm. in order to get more, more subscription and whatnot. Right. Yeah, and we're talking about the new business model. So on one end of the spectrum, uh, we're talking about uh, improving efficiency. And the other end of the spectrum, we're talking about flipping, flipping the business model on its head. Yeah, and mm -hmm. something that's very important for some industries, like the entertainment industry, is that uh, when you have companies like Netflix, which are not only are using data analytics, but they position themselves in a way where they can capture lots of data very easily, it's very difficult to compete against this thing, right? Because if I go to the cinema, a movie, like the a studio, doesn't really know my profile. You know, they don't know who I am. They need right. research to discover who I am. But Netflix knows everything about me, you know? So this, this places them strategically. It's an amazing move. Right, right. So uh, as you have been like, working into this, uh, area for quite some time now and have significant experience of, of like teaching people, writing books, as well as working in the industry across various things. So what do you think uh, are some of the tips for hiring, retaining uh, a team of data scientists or machine learning or AI engineers? So I think uh, one of the best uh, tips I can give to an executive is to first of all start with a use case and make sure you're ready for data science. Uh, I think one of the most the common mistakes I've seen is companies not being ready for data science. Maybe the data is of not, not, not good enough quality, uh, they don't know what they're looking for, and they're like, we're going to hire someone to solve this problem for us. And then this problem, this, this person that is hired feels lost. And eventually, they might end up quitting the company. So there's some work which a company needs to do before they hire someone. And that's also very important because right now, there's lots of demand for data scientists. So if, if a data scientist is not happy in a company, they're just going to find a job elsewhere. Um, so it's very important to do this preparatory work. Secondly, it's very important to understand that data science is a diverse field. So you can have people with a background in machine learning, statistics, and physics, whatever. So you can have people with very different skill sets. And again, if you don't know what you're looking for, maybe you're going to end up with the wrong person. So once you make sure that you have a use case in mind and the data is in a good state and you know who you're looking for, then you're looking into a very fruitful collaboration where everyone you know, is happy. But if you're not ready in that sense, um, then you're probably looking in a very bad situation where you're going to end up wasting time and money. Right, right, right. I, I got it. So, uh, I mean, just uh, a follow-up follow question on this. So what we have seen uh, in the industry is that people are using AI or machine learning just for the sake of using it. So if I can give you an example for this is that, just as you said, that in order to market themselves as a, as a cutting edge company or I mean a product, they actually use this AI machine learning data science terminologies to market their product. So the analogy for this is that 
uh, I mean, they actually use it just for the sake of using it. So, uh, I mean, they might be using a tank to kill a sparrow, which is not yeah. the correct thing, right? So, uh, so in this case, how, what do you recommend to different executives? Like, when is a good time they should consider like really incorporating AI into into their product? Uh, and, I mean, what are some of the like uh, key ways or key techniques to figure out that now we are okay AI ready? We should do it. Yeah, so I think my opinion is that first of all, it's good to prepare for data science from day one of a business, even if you're not planning to implement any data science for two years, let's say. The reason I'm saying this is because when you make decisions about, let's say, what kind of database you're going to use, what kind of data you're going to collect, uh, if you don't make the right decisions from day one, these are going to come back and haunt you. Now, given uh, what, what you asked about, you know, maybe using a bazooka to kill a fly, uh, I completely understand that, but this also comes down to the techniques and the people you hire. So, for example, if you, you know, if you want to do something very simple, if you just, uh, let's say you're a, a retailer, online retailer, and you want a recommender system, um, maybe you don't need to hire, you know, a PhD in deep learning to do this for you. Maybe a software developer can do this using some open source tools. Um, quite often it comes down to how lean a business uh, wants to be. Uh, unfortunately, executives are not always aware of these matters. So maybe they're like, oh, you know, we need to hire a super expert data scientist to do X, Y, Z. Um, data science, unfortunately, can seem somewhat esoteric to many people. It's one of the reasons I, you know, I wrote my book. It's one of the reasons I'm writing lots of articles that try to make data science simpler for executives. Uh, because usually I've seen two extremes, either people having very high expectations, even magical expectations, or the opposite, which is a bit more rare, um, to think that everything is very difficult. You know, we need to find a super expert to do something which really is very simple. Uh, it's rare to find an executive who actually has, uh, you know, the right understanding and expectations as to what's needed and, and you know, what level. So, like, moving forward, What's next in your opinion in the field of uh, data science, AI, or machine learning? I mean, what's, uh, what do, how do you see the future, future of it and it being transformed mm -hmm. into the next um, big thing? So I think we're going to see um, the following trends. First of all, I think automated machine learning is going to become very important. I'm doing some work in this area as well, uh, which means that it will be easier to analyze data sets. Essentially, a large part of a data scientist's work will be automated. And Google is also investing heavily in this direction. And this will make machine learning more accessible to more businesses. And secondly, I think we're going to see more work done in reinforcement learning, uh, which is an area of machine learning which many yeah. people believe is going to lead to general AI, which is going to be the main theme of the next few decades. Yeah, so people witnessing the progress in AI, in machine learning, they're like, okay, it looks like, like for the first time in history, we might actually be able to create general AI. So everyone is trying to figure out, okay, what technology should we use? And... Some people are betting on reinforcement learning. So I think we're going to see lots of money being spent on reinforcement learning in the next few years. Uh, but I wouldn't rule out that in five years, maybe, you know, we see some other advances. But uh, definitely for the next 10, 20, or 30 years, uh, everything will be pointing towards general AI. And the thing is, the vision becomes more concrete. We'll also see not only companies, but also governments throwing more money at this as soon as they realize that, hey, there's a very important strategic advantage from, you know, from, from many perspectives, but both like economic perspectives, mm -hmm. but also military, a military perspective in developing this kind of technology. Right. So um, just um, on a side note, AI has sort of some of the supplementing areas as well. Like, for example, uh, if we talk about development, then we have the DevOps or the development operations role in parallel supporting the development team. And in AI, there is sort of an emerging area called AI Ops, the Artificial <laughs> Intelligent Ops. So how do you see this particular area or role uh, becoming a core component of AI or machine learning in the future? 
I think this is normal that uh, as companies become more familiar with how to use data science, AI, machine learning, uh, then they also become more efficient and, and better at integrating these roles within a company. Uh, so I think there's nothing new here besides AI and ops. Uh, I had also spoken many years ago about the data science architect, which is a similar role. And like, um, and a few months ago, I was reading about an article talking about some kind of similar idea. Uh, essentially, as everyone understands where the, the strong and the weak points of a profession are, then a company can create different specializations in order to better integrate people's work and you know, push this work through the right channels until it's implemented. Uh, so I think like, this is a good idea, and I think we might be seeing some new roles um, in the next few years as well. So something else I had recently was the data science product manager, like a product manager who has good understanding of data science and is focused on data products. I'm like, okay, great. that's a great idea. You have a good understanding of the business. You're also a data scientist, so that's what you're leading, which is a different profile to someone who is doing, I don't know, research in neural networks in Google. Great. So I believe uh, that's it from my side. So Stylos, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. I appreciate you taking our time out of your schedule and uh, talking to our audience and discussing the, uh, discussing the key ways as well as your experience about uh, data science, machine learning, and AI. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was a great conversation. Thank you, Stelios and Asif, for your valuable time and educating us all about how AI is aiding business growth in 2020. Thanks for listening to this episode by Better Tech. If you enjoyed this podcast, give it a thumbs up and don't forget to share it across your favorite social networking platform. We look forward to bringing you the latest industry news in our next episode. In the meantime, take a look at our other episodes and hit subscribe with the links in the description box below so that you don't miss out on the latest in tech.